welcome. My name is Rafael Fonseca. I'm a hematologist at the Mayo Clinic, and I'm delighted to have uh, with me today Dr. David C. Norris. This is um, episode four of our series of innovation in, in medicine. Um, David is uh, someone who I've gotten to know through Twitter. We, we're, we're sort of Twitter uh, friends and started following each other, and I followed his work very, very closely. And um, I, I think he has some very, very important and interesting concepts that I, that I wanted to discuss with him. And obviously, I want to have this be shared uh, more widely, as I think this is, this is of, of importance and relevance to, to all of us as oncologists. And, you know, as, as, as we see patients, I think this, this relates to all of them. Uh, before going on, let me just make a quick introduction to David. So he operates a scientific and statistical consultancy uh, group that is uh, focused on methodology development. Uh, for precision medicine applications. Um, he developed uh, what's known as a dose titration algorithm tuning, DTAT, which is a methodological framework that enables us to think about dose individualization um, as a process for continuous learning. You know, that starts with really early on with early phase clinical trials and continues through the drug development uh, process. And we'll have an opportunity to hear a lot more about this during our conversations. Um, he also originated uh, a very, very important concept, uh, uh, the coherence notion for dose finding trials, something called the precautionary coherence, and again, he'll, he'll explain this more. Uh, David is a doctor like us. He, he earned his MD degree from Brown University and has worked in diverse application areas, including mathematical finance, operations research, systems engineering, and he's a distinguished fellow of the European Society for the Pearson, Pearson Center uh, Healthcare. So David, it's a pleasure to be uh, here with you, um, and, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Oh, thank you, Rafael. I'm so glad to uh, have the opportunity. David, I, I think you should know, just before we get going, the other day I was thinking, what do I do for retirement? And this is going to be the, one of the most nerdy things you'll hear, but I thought, you know, when I retire, I want to go back to advanced math, and it's no small part because of some of the work that you and others present in Twitter. It's rekindled my interest in in, in math and particularly as it relates to medicine, so. Oh, that's wonderful, yeah. It, it, you know, there's, a, there's this whole um, math onco community. I don't know if you follow them on Twitter, but so much interesting stuff uh, coming out. Uh, from, you know, some of it I can pretend to follow because of the sophistication of some of those discussions, but I'm well aware of some of the conversations. Uh, we actually have uh, at the Mayo Clinic a number of people who are interested in math. There's uh, mm -hmm. David Dingley, I don't know if you know David, and Christine Swanson, who are working on mathematical models and how that relates to imaging, et cetera. But there's, there's certainly plenty, plenty of opportunities there. So, but anyway, again, thank you and, and, and welcome for, for being here. Uh, David, I, um, I know you and, you and I have interacted and have talked about some of the things we, we would like to discuss today, but I just wanted to set up as a, as a framework uh, this notion that there's kind of four concepts that I want to weave into our conversation today. I mean, number one, probably the, the most important, the, the one at hand right now is the, the methods aspect, the methodological aspects of what you're doing and why that's, that, that's important. Um, associated with this as number two, I, I want us to talk about the ethics uh, because again, this touches everyone. This is right at the bedside. Every time we see a patient in the clinic, how does this relate to clinical trials? Obviously, and, and I alluded to that during the introduction, your, your linkage to uh, precision medicine. Uh, it's, a, it's obviously a you know, buzzword, something we're all talking about, but it's so obviously deficient when you start considering some of the things you have to say. And, and last but not least, another topic of my interest is how does this imperfection uh, links to inefficiencies in the economy of how we think about drugs and optimal use of drugs and pharmacoeconomics and all the like. So, what, what, you know, we, we can start um, and, and, you know, maybe maybe I can provide a little bit of my clinical experiences as we get into the topics. But as you know, I deal with myeloma, multiple myeloma, and, and it's a disease that we're very fortunate because we have incredibly useful biomarkers that we use to try to find, you know, whether we're doing uh, the, the, the right thing when it comes down to disease control. Uh, but I think your work extends beyond that because you can actually, you know, look at efficacy, but we don't necessarily have the same equivalent for looking at toxicity. And I, I think this is, you know, in the ideal world, you would have all of your gauges where you can look at efficacy, you know, you're doing the right thing, but also you have the right gauges so you can look at toxicity. And, you know, we infer that sometimes from some of the blood work uh, uh, that, that we do. But um, with that in mind, let's just start with a sort of an opening, uh, opening salvo. You say that you're against a one size fits all. You even have terms for that. Do you mind breaking that down and explaining a little bit to us? 
Yeah, sure, sure. And I would love to hear more, Raphael, about you know, your own uh, uh, experience with titration, you know, dose reduction, dose intensification in your patients, maybe based on some of those biomarkers and you know, whether you do that um, and whether, whether some of your colleagues do that as well. Uh, so the problem here is that, you know, this problem that I'm addressing under the moniker of one size fits all dose finding. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a pattern, it starts in, in phase one trials where uh, the aim, the outcome of that phase one trial is supposed to be a single dose that is, um, that is then to be used in phase two when we begin looking at efficacy, right? Uh, the phase one trial is typically regarded as, um, uh, as one that is focused more on toxicity. It's a, something that's supposed to uh, happen relatively rapidly. Uh, and we're supposed to relatively rapidly arrive at um, a single dose, the maximum tolerated dose, or the recommended phase two dose, which is then carried forward into further testing. Um, and uh, if you look at, uh, you know, it's been known for, for 20 years now, we've had this evidence accumulating, uh, that the patients who have more adverse uh, effects from chemotherapy, say, right, are, are, the, are typically the, the ones who will, um, who will have better outcomes. Uh, and, and this sort of, uh, and, and this data is very well established across many indications. Um, in, 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 uh, in the case of chemotherapy, is beginning to uh, accrue also in the case of you know, uh, molecularly targeted agents. Uh, and you know, certainly, in, even in the case of, uh, of CAR T therapy, right? It's, it's known, I heard a, a great talk by Nirali Shah uh, from the NCI uh, back in May, where she said that, uh, you know, that, in, that the, the cytokine release syndrome uh, is a very strong correlate of the efficacy of, of CAR T, so, so that you know, they're willing to, um, and they hope to actually achieve a grade four CRS in, in pediatric patients that they're caring for, to the, to the point where it, uh, the patients may have to be intubated, artificially ventilated, uh, precisely because of that strong correlation between the adverse effect uh, and, the, and the therapeutic effect of, of, the, of the, the therapy. Um, so, uh, you know, these, these two things are at odds. This practice that we've had for a long time now of trying to find the recommended phase two dose and carrying forward a single dose uh, throughout later phases of drug development. Uh, and the, the evidence um, that's, you know, the, 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 the evidence is accrued formally, as well as, you know, just the, if you, if you will, the sort of bioplausibility of um, this strong correlation between adverse effects and, um, and efficacy. You know, it's always struck me that we have such rigidity in how we think about this thing. I'm sure we'll get more about this. Yeah. How do you try to go from the, from the general to the individual? And I think any one of us would recognize that if you say, listen, we have the MTD for a drug uh, based on nine patients because there were three dose levels. And that's what actually becomes clinical practice for years to come. I mean, yeah. it's just almost laughable when we, when we think about that concept right now. There's Fortunately, I think there's a, there's a lot of play down the line that comes from, you know, empiricism where people realize maybe you don't need that high of a dose or you need that you could use a different schedule, you can modify that. But that's kind of all in the back end with a significant delay. And I think one, 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 one better argument would be that, you know, why not be a little bit more rational on how we start, right? Instead of just saying, yes, we cross that boundary, we can move to phase two. Yeah get a little bit more precise as we think about moving that, uh, that needle. So, so and, and you have some thoughts on how that can be done. Yeah, I think that, that what's needed, I think, is an admission that we are going to be learning as we're going mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Uh, and you know, some of them are just sort of, uh, I think, have to do with a, a corporate culture. We like to have this idea that we've definitively established something uh, and that we can then move on on the basis of that definitively established fact. Um, and of course, you know, if, if you have that view about everything we have to learn in the course of drug development, then clearly uh, you need to decide on dose early. Uh, but, you know, the fact is that, uh, that maybe you can't. Maybe you need to sort of uh, find a window of, of doses, a dose range. You know, uh, decades ago, you used to call these things dose ranging studies. Correct. Uh, and maybe what we need to come out of... Uh, uh, phase one with is just a, a sense of what an appropriate dose range is. Uh, and maybe we have to continue learning about the right dose range over time. 
you know, there's this uh, conference coming up in, in October uh, um, uh, that uh, Tatiana Prowell is, is, uh, has uh, um, uh, set up where they'll be talking about de-intensification of therapy. And certainly, they, you know, this is, uh, this is in phase four already, right? Uh, sure. If breast cancer, I think. Uh, maybe uh, you, you, you can learn only in phase four that we've been giving too much. And, and maybe we can safely uh, dial back the, the, the intensity of therapy and, 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 and still preserve uh, the efficacy. And, you know, it's very interesting because as, as you're talking, I'm thinking of an analogy. It's like we're almost, you know, with, with sculpting, right? We have a big, big set of body of knowledge. We have that mass that we're sculpting something, trying to make it perfect. And sometimes you start with a lot. I mean, an example of this is childhood leukemia, right? So that pretty much the sink was thrown to, to, to kids. Now, the very fortunate part of that story is that, you know, children have a very high survival probability now. Uh, but very quickly, people realize with so, some very serious uh, downstream effects. So, so it has been by subtracting down the line, right? But, but arguably, yeah. the, the opposite is true. So, the, 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 you know, the, the negative effects of omission, you know, maybe for some patients, they need, they need those higher doses. And if we give them treatment, we're all comfortable, but really not achieving what we're, we're trying to achieve. I mean, this example of childhood leukemia and the omission of radiation and, you know, shut, uh, cutting back a little bit on the duration of therapy. I, so I, I think your point is excellent, that acceptance that we, we have this process that needs to continue to evolve. We're clearly not there. Yeah, we, and, it, you know, it's odd. Uh, even, you know, even most physicists, right, you know, physics, I think, is the, the crown jewel of our sure. scientific knowledge. And, you know, there are, there are physical theories that have been um, tested to something like, you know, insane number, 12 uh, significant figures, some insane number like that, right? Uh, and yet, m most physicists will tell you that they don't believe that their theories are literally true. They're probably just approximations. And yet, here in medicine, right, uh, really at the complete opposite end of, of our capacity to know, um, the, the, the emotional burdens of, of, uh, um, uh, of the, the medical context, I think, create in us a desire for justified certain knowledge that's just out of proportion to what we can actually have. And so we have all these means of um, pretending that we know more than we do. Uh, it, it, it certainly helps us to feel comfortable. Uh, you, you know, even look at the, the language that's used. We declare the MTBD to be such and such. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> and we never well, declare something. You know, speaking of emotion, uh, um, I just recently uh, had the opportunity to hear a video from uh, uh, Michelle Akkad. I, I think you know, you know Michelle yeah, yeah. From, from Twitter, and he was making a presentation to medical students at the meeting for the Benjamin Rush Institute, and he was oh. he, he 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 made a statement which really stuck with me, and I had thought about this, but it, it, he I never thought about it as clearly. He said that medicine is primarily sort of an ethical endeavor, a human endeavor that is supported by science. Yeah, and 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 ever since I heard that, I can't get off my my head the concept because it's so true, because a lot of what we do, you know, relates to to that human aspect. So I was going to say related to the emotion and the human aspect, you have found significant resistance when you talk about this. It's like you're saying, guys, if we if we find this new way of doing this, you know, this this might be helpful, and and I, I would say probably to your surprise, you have found some significant resistance to the concept. Yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, and you know, not a, a lot of it is, um, you know, it's it's not very well uh, thought through. It's a kind of uh, a gut resistance. Um, you know, many of the, uh, you know, many of the ideas that I, I bring out in in this uh, dose titration algorithm tuning or DTAT framework uh, are, uh, you know, even though I I, I make an effort to uh, connect them with. Uh, core concepts of biostatistics. On the whole, the, this idea that we continuously learn, that we don't, uh, uh, that, that we can't uh, sort of definitively establish something at a given point, uh, is anathema to you know, many biostatisticians. So that there are there are ingrained cultural uh, uh, and and you know technological or methodological. Um, uh, uh, prejudices that 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 DTAT tends to disrupt. Uh, so I, I think I understand the resistance. 
and uh, you know, I I I, I attempt to uh, to elicit more, you know, uh, resistance, uh, ex you know, explicitly, uh, you know, social media and the like. Sure. Um, sure. And um, actually, I, I tend to be more disappointed by the 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 lack of overt resistance. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, you know, that I, I I try to be I try to be relatively gentle, you know, in social sure. media. Uh, but I probe the one size fits all just every now and then, and you know, none of them really taking me up on this. Well, you know, it's it's it's, it's absolutely true. Sometimes the worst resistance is ignorance, right? When or yeah. you, people is like they don't they don't want to respond on it. I face yeah. that too, in, in you know, social media. Sometimes you post things, and the best answer when you don't do anything, just be quiet, just don't bite into things. So, but <laughs> it's, it's ironic, and I think you and I we, we talked about this briefly. Um, I can tell you a little bit more about myeloma, but. You know, myeloma, maybe it's a little bit more niche, but people think about coumadin and insulin. I mean, those are things that are, that, that there's those titration, there's adjustment based on the, on the markers. Now, I fully realize we don't have markers like this for everything we treat. So there's, you know, if you're, if you're treating for, and maybe we should, maybe one day we will, you know, if you're treating for bronchitis with, it's suspected to be bacterial or confirmed bacterial, you get an antibiotic, you're not measured, you just give it five days, right? But there's, Many things we do in medicine, maybe, I mean, um, heparin would be another example, where you actually, you have this nomograms, you have this adjustment. So it's, it's really intrinsic to medicine, but it seems to be like a little bit look, looked like a, you know, suspect in, in the field of oncology. And I don't get that part. Yeah. Well, so, for, I mean, for you in, in multiple myeloma, you, um, I, I really um, uh, don't know so much about the biomarkers that you, you have. Uh, you, you, you cited uh, some very powerful and useful biomarkers. Do you ever, with a patient, let's say, um, who's tolerating the standard dose of the therapy, but maybe the biomarkers, I and mean, we'd love to have you explain them, are not showing a lot of efficacy, do you ever feel inclined to counsel that patient about an intensification um, all, all, all the time, all the time. So let me give you, I'll give you a, like a three minute synopsis and we haven't yeah. talked about this before, but you know, so myeloma is, is, you know, I'm sorry, some of this is very obvious, but let me just say for the audience that tumor of plasma cells, mm -hmm. in these plasma cells under normal circumstances, they produce antibodies that, you know, we, we, we use as part of our immune, uh, humoral immunity. Now the, the cells, of course, when they're clonally expanded, they continue to produce antibodies. And these antibodies, of course, are generated from the mutational process of the genes, the IGH gene and the lambda gene. So there's a unique sequence for the DNA and a unique sequence for the protein that comes about because of that. Now, this is the original biomarker. In fact, even in the 1800s, Ben Sion's protein was first described as one of the markers for myeloma. And, and, and I argue, and this has nothing to do with myeloma doctors, but this is the best biomarker that exists for any cancer because it's not only disease-specific, but it's actually... Uh, patient specific, it's tumor specific, it's clone specific. So we have sometimes patients, yeah. with, you know, two different clones, it's, it's uncommon, but that can happen. And the biomarkers may reflect that. And, and, and what I, I think it's a great opportunity to learn about biomarkers because we have measured this by routing clinical assays. We measure them in the blood, we measure them in the urine, and we use these markers for a number of things, you know, sometimes just for diagnosis itself, you know, patient who's in the hospital with anemia, we get an SPEP, they have a high uh, protein and it turns out to be a monoclonal protein. Then we say, oh, myeloma is probably the cost. But we use them also to, to, to gauge how we're doing with treatment. Now, historically, these biomarkers were used just to know if you were making progress with the treatment. And, and you know, in years gone by, our approach was mostly, okay, these are the doses. And then we de-escalate if there is toxicity. And we hope that that de-escalation doesn't reflect in increasing the protein, meaning that the disease somehow is becoming refractory or, or progressing on lower doses, right? But nowadays, there's a number of other opportunities where, for instance, we can have a patient on, on you know, myeloma and they get a stem cell transplant. They're placed, placed on maintenance post-transplant, which is a lower dose of one of the medications, in this case, lenalidomide. And then it, in time, the patient progresses. So the question in everyone's mind, well, with a, with a higher dose, do better. Or we have drugs that can be given at a whole range of dosing. One of, one of the best examples for this is carfilzomib. Uh, carfilzomib, which is an injectable medication, is a protosome inhibitor, um, can work at certain doses, but it turns out it appears to work at higher doses. Now, even this generates a lot of controversy because people say, well, you know, if, if you give higher doses, that's kind of not the standard dose, but the question is, what is really the standard dose for carfilzomib? There's, 
there's a study. It's uh, you know there's there's some some um, critiques of it and you know why it's good or you know what are maybe some of the limitations that compared to protosome inhibitors, car, you know, carfilzomib and bortezomib. Uh, but carfilzomib was used at a higher dose, but you know it did well in the trial. And so people say, well, you got to consider it was higher dose, but it's like saying you know you're racing two cars. And the one on the right just pushed the gas pedal all the way to the bottom. It's like, well, that's the real world, right? So, so we're dealing with all of these things right now of how we do uh, uh, titration. As I mentioned, mostly it has been through reductions because of toxicity. Uh, but many of us are dealing with the thought of re-escalation or doing, doing higher doses. And it's still very, very rough. It's nothing close to what you have described for, for a better you know, titration approximation. But um, I, I think the question is very relevant. Uh huh. It almost makes me wonder if you know you could take observationally, you know, the the electronic health records of myeloma patients, and maybe you know, looking at that this um, Ben's Jones protein and some of your other biomarkers, and uh, you know, n noting uh, uh, the uh, uh, dose uh, uh, reductions and the like. If you could maybe estimate what the uh, you know dose response or exposure response um, curve looks like. You, you know how many studies of that exist? Very few, very, very few. So I, 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 think, I think we need to do more of that because I, I, admittedly, and, and when we practice with it, there's a little bit of intuition here, and I wanna get into that a little bit later as we talk about evidence-based medicine, right? But there's a little bit of intuition that if I have a patient, like say if I have a patient that I start on, 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 on one of those drugs and I didn't start a second one because the person had a, some comorbidity that would make it unlikely to be beneficial, but then after one cycle, I see that the patient is doing really well with that drug. In my mind, I have a question, do I really add the second one or do I stay on course on what I'm doing? So that, that integration of you know, the clinical experience, the, 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 the dosing as we see it, and then based on, on what we know from the clinical trials, just that's the conversation that happens right there at the bedside. Yeah, yeah. And you know, that, that, uh, I'm sure that that, you know, that decision you, you have very little actually you have very little science to, to feed into that decision right uh, I mean right. Uh, uh, you know and, and again all of that math onco stuff about uh, you know the, uh, the, the, the amount of clonal variability in, in the in the tumor um, uh, and uh, some of the evolutionary dynamics of, sure. of tumors right? that that all comes into making that that kind of a decision now, certainly, with one of the reasons that I strategically uh, that I focused on phase one is that the the heuristics are a bit simpler in phase one. Uh, you know, in a phase one cancer clinical trial, and you know, certainly DTET I think would apply with with other uh, uh, with 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 you know, uh, with drugs that have uh, serious adverse effects and and important. Uh, therapeutic value in other diseases besides cancer. Sure. Uh, but, but, you know, once again, the cancer phase one clinical trial has, this, has, has some very special uh, heuristics connected. With you. Typically, this is a, a patient who has uh, exhausted all standard therapies. Um, uh, and, you know, increasingly, yes, uh, sometimes the phase one trial looks good even to a patient who hasn't, who hasn't done this uh, you know, because with the advent of precision medicine. Uh, but but the, the typical heuristic is that everything, the tr patient has tried everything else. Uh, all the other therapies have, uh, you know, um, been exhausted. They failed to, to help the patient. And the patient is still willing to try something new and untried, you know, something never before tried in humans. Uh, and in that setting, uh, you uh, you know often there's there's actually a short life expectancy as well, uh, which brings in the time scale on which the learning can occur here, um, and a simple heuristic like the MTD heuristic. Well, we're just going to give you you know we, we have very little idea what the the ther what the dose response in terms of therapeutic response sure. curve looks like here. So what we're going to try to do since we've decided to try this experimental therapy um, is we're going to give you as, as big a dose as you're able to tolerate as you're willing to tolerate, and um, uh, in the hope that by giving the largest dose, we're also giving you the best hope for a benefit from this experimental treatment. Um, and it's that, you know, that heuristic has a, a, a marvelous simplifying effect on the problem that, you know, uh, that simplifying effect is not present, certainly in the clinical situation you described. Yeah, perfect. The, the word heuristics is perfect there because is that you know that simplifying aspect of 
you know, thinking is expensive, right? And for people that are running the clinic and are, are you know, it's just, our lives are consumed with extra responsibilities. I'd be remiss in saying we're almost like 20 minutes into this, so perhaps a little bit more. And really? I have to say, we, we, haven't, we haven't even, you know, uh, touched. I, I wonder if you could give us a synopsis of those titration, you know, algorithm. What, what, do, what does that mean for people who have not read about this before? Yeah, so uh, uh, it probably the, the, the best way to describe it is the way I described it in this sort of opening salvo of my DTAT research program, which is this um, it's a peer-reviewed uh, paper on uh, F1000 research, uh, where I undertake uh, a, a simulation-based demonstration of what, uh, of what uh, DTAT would look like. So the, the, first, the first point that I think you, you make is that you're no longer trying to find the dose. Uh, what you're trying to find is a dose titration algorithm. That's the DTA of DTAT. Uh, what you're trying to learn is how do I titrate over multiple courses of therapy in a patient to find the dose that's right for him or her? Uh, that's the question you're asking, not what is the dose I'm going to give to everybody. Uh, and uh, then what you what you uh, you do is you, you start with a an approximate dose titration algorithm and you tune it or tweak it. That's what the last T of DTAT is: is dose titration algorithm tuning. And you you tweak that um, that titration procedure um, as you enroll patients in your trial and you learn from them. you know, you might enroll a few patients in the trial and learn. Gosh, you know what this. Uh, this titration procedure is too aggressive. It's going up too fast and we're overdosing patients and we're getting bad adverse effects very quickly. So let's tune that back. Let's, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, increase doses more slowly in patients. Or maybe you realize, gosh, you know, we're starting everybody at this really low dose. Everybody ends up going up to a high dose. Let's start a little bit higher so that we're not wasting so much time. Um, and uh, so that's the basic principle. Uh, it, it's, it's a principle that steps back from trying to learn the recommended phase two dose right away and settle on it and establish it and write it down in the forms, right? Um, uh, it's, uh, it's about acknowledging that we're going to be learning as we go throughout this entire process. We have a provisional DTA that we start with, and that gets modified as, as time goes on. The, the de particular demonstration that's provided there um, is, uh, uh, is the titration of docetaxel. It's this commonly used um, uh, chemotherapy drug uh, based on uh, the patient's response um, in, in the form of, you know, its most uh, common adverse effect is neutropenia. The, the neutrophils, those white blood cells that are sort of first responders to a, a new infection, um, uh, they, uh, you know, they get really hit pretty hard by, by, this, uh, by this drug because, you know, they're produced in the bone marrow in the same way. And this is for the audience, of course. Uh, sure. They're produced in the bone marrow in the, in the same, you know, in much the same manner that the, the tumor is, is multiplying, right? You know, it's sort of a, uh, it's a very rapid uh, multiplication that happens in, your, uh, in these progenitor cells in the bone marrow. So uh, the idea is you give a first dose, you know, a small one. You watch what happens to the neutrophils. You, you catch the neutrophils at their nadir, their, their lowest point. And you know, if that nadir is not, you know, let's say, if it's not down to 500, you might intensify the therapy. And the idea is that you, you change the, um, the dose until you get to a neutrophil nadir that is, you know, achieves a balance between, uh, between safety and, uh, um, with respect to infection, right? The risk of infection and uh, pr the presumed efficacy of the drug against the tumor. Now, in the ideal world, you would have, for the titration component, you would have the right tools to know exactly how to titrate, right? So, so how far are you pushing so that you get the dose that is required for the optimal cell killing uh, and yet yeah. do so safely? And I think we have, well, I mean, one, that's one of the things we need to develop. I, that's, I, I feel fortunate, again, in myeloma, that we have those markers because I think we know a little bit more about safety. So it's very obvious if someone comes with, you know, with serious complication. But, but, but efficacy, it's a little bit something that plays out over time for certain interventions, certain tumors. Some of them over a very long period of time, which makes it even more challenging. You know, immunotherapy would be one of, one of the obvious examples, right? So you might not see things right away that yeah. may be very good in the long term. Yeah, that's true. And, and um, this is why I think a focus on learning uh, helps because, you know, we learn on different timescales about different things. Uh, and that's certainly, uh, that's certainly already part of the notion that we have about phase one, two, and three. You know, in phase one, uh, 
we learn about toxicities that happen immediately, typically. Mm -hmm. And then in phase two, we, we, uh, you know, we, we start uh, having a, a long enough time to observe uh, efficacy in terms of you know, increased survival and, and so on. Um, and then in these larger phase three trials, we, we learn other things that we couldn't learn in, in smaller uh, trials. Um, so, um, so yeah, and certainly with, with, some, with some drugs, right, there are effects that occur over a long term. And, uh, and I think that it's important to keep in mind uh, the time scale on which different effects are happening and on which we can expect to learn about them. And also, you know, relate those time scales to the time scales that are implicit in you know, ultimately the patient's situation. And, and then going back a little bit to the, to the um, human aspect of this, and I know this is, this is something that a debate goes on always with the intent of phase one trials. Yeah. I think, I think we're getting, we're getting, um, Arguably, we're getting smarter about how to do them. I mean, it's been a, a, a pretty, pretty, just, you know, rough approach that we've had in the past. Um, and there's this concept of, if, is this the intent merely sort of a scientific one versus, you know, there's, there's some, some therapeutic intent. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that anyone um, who thinks about participation in a clinical trial probably has a certain element that, yeah, I understand, even if it's fully disclosed, I understand there's, this component of, of toxicity, but I would like to think, it just stands to reason, right? I would like to think that maybe this is the drug, even if we don't know anything, that maybe it's gonna be the great blockbuster in the future for my condition. So, so I think there's, there's a little bit of, of that element. So, so then that gets challenged because one, and the, 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 you know, I, I want to, to ask you a little bit about the precautionary coherence too as well, that, you know, yeah, yeah we, we sometimes have to start as drugs, and everyone understands why, at very low levels, because you don't know if what you're going to do in a first-in-human study will be, would, would be potentially highly toxic, maybe mm -hmm. even lethal. Uh, so, so that person that goes into that first dose level has some skin in the game, significant skin in the game, in that, yeah. you know, they're, they're, they're putting uh, their convenience and, and expenses and potential toxicity in the line when they do that. So I guess one of the ways that you phrase it is that person already has shown some, some commitment. I mean, isn't there like an ethical correspondent commitment to say, well, if you already went through this, maybe, you know, I could offer you the next dose level. And, and, and not only that, but I actually would be in a better position to try it in the same person as opposed to even exposing more humans. So there's, I know there's a little bit of a circular logic to that. You explain it better in your writings, but I don't think we talk enough about that. No, we really don't. And you know, this, this precautionary coherence principle, right? Um, uh, you know, you talked about, you, so you, you opened up talking about the math, right? And certainly right. that DTAT paper and F1000 research uh, is pretty heavy on the math. You know, I, I refer to some, some fairly advanced notions uh, in time series statistics, for example. Uh, but as time has gone on, my view of the problem has become simpler and simpler. Uh, and, and this precautionary coherence paper that I published, uh, you know, just uh, it was the last, it was just uh, the last week of um, of 2017. It uh, uh, it really operates at the other end. It operates at a very simple level that I think uh, that I think you could talk about even in the informed consent process, right? So you could imagine a, a patient right sitting there with the, the the PI who's doing the informed consent. Uh, and the PI is uh, asking the patient to join this, uh, or you know, suggesting that this patient might want to join a phase one trial. The patient could say, well, so I, I understand something about these, uh, these escalation designs. This is this one of those escalation designs? The PI says, yeah. The patient says, so where am I? You know, am I in an early cohort or a late cohort? You know, you're actually the, you're the third person we're enrolling. And uh, so you'll be enrolled in that same low dose cohort as the, as the previous two people. And, you, know, you could ask, well, how, how have the other people done? Do they have any adverse effects? No, no adverse effects. And, and you could say, well, so I'm starting at a pretty low dose. Um, if you start enrolling later, if, you, if later on you start enrolling people at higher doses, um, will you tell me about that and give me a chance to try that higher dose? That's a, that's a conversation that, that, you know, that, that the, the enrolling uh, participant and the PI could have. Um, and you know, if the PI is gonna stick with, that, with the dose escalation design, uh, the PI is going to have to say, well, no, that's not the way we do this. Uh, and, 
and you know there, there's there's actually no there's no reasonable excuse for 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 not allowing that patient to escalate conversely right uh, the patient could be um, enrolling later on, right? And the patient says, well, so where am I in the, in the dose escalation scheme? So, oh, you know, you're, you're actually patient number 18. And so we're going to be enrolling you into a higher dose level than anybody else before. And then the, the patient can say, well, you know, have, have any of the other um, uh, people at lower dose levels had any adverse effects? Yeah, there have been a few, but, um, but only 20%, right? And our target is 25%. Uh, the, the patient can say, well, gosh, you know, um, I'm willing to try something new, but I don't really want to take a big risk of having a, an adverse effect. Could we start me at one of the lower doses and, you know, maybe consider going up? That, that conversation, again, totally reasonable on the patient's perspective. Uh, it, it just, it utterly unravels the, the dose escalation design. So Boy, this gets really complicated so fast because... I think, I think we, we can all understand why some of these this boundaries yeah. exist, right? And why you have to go through the escalation. But when you present it from that perspective, from, from the point of, of self-determination, the, you know, the answer would be, well, why not? But here's, here's an irony to this. You might say, well, listen, and, which is true, you know, participating in a clinical trial or having access to a compound is not intrinsically a right for anyone, right? It's an option. Mm -hmm. It's not about the right of the option, but it's about the... the consistency of the of that conversation with and with that fiduciary responsibility with the physician that's presenting this to patients but what's even more interesting is that even if you buy into that even if you said listen you know it is an option which i, I actually buy to the concept this is not a right you don't have a right to participate in this trials these are options that you know we open up for patients but even if you're like a purist or strict there you would still have to agree with a, with you know the precautionary coherence notion that well, if you're all about protection, protect patient C, since you already have patients A and B in that first cohort that, that are willing to do that and are, you know, uh, interested perhaps in going to that second cohort instead of bringing another party, and yet we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, uh, um, I'm not, I, I think, however, that a patient who has that conversation and or you know, uh, uh, um, a would-be trial participant who has that conversation and isn't satisfied with it, uh, might well, you know, prefer to try another uh, phase one trial. Sure. To the extent that, you know, to the, to the extent that uh, some competition is introduced here, and, you know, certainly this is a big problem with phase one trials, right? They, they enroll too slowly, um, and, you know, many of them don't enroll enough patients. Um, uh, that if, if there's some competition for patients, then trials with more uh, ethical and patient-friendly designs uh, will, you know, will win out in the end. They'll enroll faster. And, and, and again, I'll say it's just, just mind-boggling to me that some of these things are not in the domain of discussion of most bioethicists because it seems to be pretty, pretty obvious that, you know, and, and, and again, we're describing a conundrum. We're not describing necessarily uh, something that is, that is uh, uh, I guess, maybe more than conundrum, something that potentially could be controversial, but yet we don't see that conversation happening with regards to phase one. In fact, it's better not to have the conversation if you just remove any potential therapeutic aspect to phase one trials. Yeah, I, I am surprised myself that, uh, that bioethicists who have, you know, who actually invested a lot of energy in criticizing this notion of uh, the therapeutic intent of phase one trials. Um, attempting to assert that they are, you know, uh, fundamentally and strictly scientific endeavors, um, have not, you know, have not ever looked at the uh, at the designs of these trials closely enough, and with the participant in mind, uh, sufficiently in mind, to recognize this precautionary coherence principle. Uh, it, without, it's, without without getting into politics, but do you think yeah. it's the prevailing sort of notion that the group's good is better than the individual group as, as this is being decided. Yeah, I, I, I have to think, you know, this is what I have to, this is what I have to conclude, is that, um, is that, you know, you know, there's, there certainly are, uh, there's a whole sort of, you know, it looks to me as if there is a very sort of active and prominent and noisy uh, uh, realm within biostatistics, uh, I'm sorry, within uh, bioethics. These are the people we hear from on Twitter. Uh, yeah. but that there is another 
you know, more, um, uh, you know, more thoughtful uh, realm of biostatistics, uh, uh, sorry, bioethics, uh, that maybe we don't hear from so much. But if we talk about mainstream uh, bioethics, if we agree to talk about that, uh, then it looks to me as if most of that is driven by a collectivist agenda, which, which wants to see, um, uh, which wants to submerge the, the individual and, and the prerogatives of the individual to collectivistic ends, uh, which wants to see uh, the, the scientific aspect of a phase one trial uh, celebrated over the, the therapeutic aspect. Uh, and uh, I think that's the, I, I really don't see any other explanation for how a, a bioethicist could become an expert in phase one trials and pursue a research program around uh, the question of the therapeutic intent of phase one trials without ever once trying to improve, you know, recognizing this deep flaw in the, the current design of these phase one trials uh, that undermines that, um, that therapeutic intent. You know, I, I think you're 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 absolutely right. I have had a, an opportunity to interact with with various bioethicists recently, and I'm pleased to think that there's there's a diversity of opinion with regards to some of these aspects. You know, and and there's some some inconsistencies. You know, some some bioethicists might say, you know, take take another topic, might say, well, listen, I support um, physician assisted suicide as as the ultimate proof of uh, you know self uh, determination and autonomy. And yet, are are you're so vehemently opposed to things like right to try and things like that? So, I, I think I think we need to. I mean, maybe maybe the the technology and the science is a little bit ahead of that conversation. But I think we need to we we all need to get engaged on this because, again, at the end of the day, as I said before, it's primarily an ethical endeavor that is supported mm -hmm. by a science. And talking about science and ethical endeavors, so some of the things you say are uh, a little bit not anathema, not necessarily contrary to, but it's sometimes hard to reconcile, again, this with, with sort of EBM principles, right? So I use this analogy. I, I think uh, we, we can all agree from what we have right now, I think one of the best approximations, going back to physics, as you say, one of the best approximations we have to truth is, is our phase three trials. And, you know, we, we, we all recognize that and it removes so many bias, but there, there's some limitations that are not often described as well too, and how that applies how do you bring the group uh, to, to, to the individual, right? But I, I think, I, I want to think that there is a future that we can some, somehow take the best aspects of both. So I think of wars as they were fought in the 1700s where they just line up soldiers in a straight line, right? So that was the way to do war. Yeah. And, and you couldn't question that. That was kind of the way to go. And I, that's how I think right now about some of, some of the ways we're doing phase three because they don't recognize those. They don't recognize, you know, genetic, heterogeneity, even simple things like, you know, anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, you know, it's like, yeah, the trials were done aspirin versus Coumadin and this and that, but, but probably the answers don't really apply equally to all participants. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but look at, look at the, for example, at a trial of uh, Coumadin for atrial fibrillation. Uh, at the very least there, the Coumadin is titrated to achieve an INR. Sure. Right? Uh, to which is, and some people are going to need a, a, a larger dose, some people are going to need a smaller dose to achieve a target INR of 2.5 or 3.0. So that even in the design of those trials, there's an attempt to recognize the heterogeneity across patients uh, and, to, um, ex and to exclude that at the level of the design of the trial so that then when we examine the outcomes of the trial, uh, we can learn, you know, we can learn something interesting. Not do patients getting a dose of, you know, five of Coumadin versus seven of Coumadin do better, but do do, do patients uh, getting a, you know, what is the balance of risk between atrial fibrillation and and, uh, and uh, hemorrhage look like when you're targeting an INR of three or when you're targeting an INR of two point five? Uh, and I I wish that we would attempt to do more of that to recognize that there are uh, sources of variation from one individual to another that we could design away we could uh, in our trials and and that's that's you know, that's very much my hope for the phase one trial that uses DTA. Uh, we're we're going to uh, employ this DTA which we're constantly learning how to improve to get each patient to as as large a dose let's say as he or she will tolerate and then we're going to learn in phase two what the outcomes look like.
Yeah, and I, but you know, honest, and I don't want to be a buzzkill, but it's almost like Aristotelian aspirations that we have when you describe that, because you know, a lot of the clinical trials have to be redone. I mean, if we go back to the Coumadin, and I, my hematology yeah. colleagues would not allow me to not mention things that, well, even if you had the right assay, I mean, do you really measure with the INR? That's, is that the best measurement for achieving a certain level of anticoagulation? Yeah. And even if you did, within that population, there's going to be various polymorphisms that will dictate, you know, some people metabolize different, you know, uh, the, the essential elements associated with anticoagulation and, you know, vitamin K antagonists. So you can envision that there's maybe 5% of the population that could do very well with baby aspirin. The other 80% will do very well with Coumadin and 20% maybe with neither. They need a direct anticoagulant, you know, and, and oral anticoagulant. So there's, there's all this nuance that is, is, is not necessarily contemplated in, in their classical forms of clinical research. Now, this is not in no way disparaging. I think it's just describing a mathematical reality for the real world when we think about all the variables that come into play in clinical trials. Yeah, uh, and you know, maybe what you're aiming at also is that, um, is that if we, well, you, you know, EBM, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, if we're gonna see how, you know, DTAT, let's say, attacks some of the prejudices of EBM, I think what you see in EBM is a, a rejection of theoretical knowledge. Um, and it's, you know, formally, I, I would identify it with, you know, with, with what Karl Popper called inductivism. It's this view that we could just collect the data and we can, um, he, Karl Popper talked about the, uh, the bucket theory of the mind. In sure. which the mind consists of, it's a bucket, and you pour observations into the bucket, and inside the bucket, uh, that those observations congeal into knowledge. Uh, and that's very much the picture of human knowledge that I think most people, most of the EBMists will adhere to. It's that we, we collect data and uh, assemble them into uh, the recommendation that the, that the trial yields. You know, people talk about the evidence tells us this. And what they mean is that the mass effects that we've collected tells us this. Uh, there is a... Um, there is a tendency in all of this to reject the theoretical knowledge and to reject the attempt to um, examine and explore uh, our, our theoretical knowledge, to, to, to get more understanding about it. And that rejection of theoretical knowledge is very much at the heart, I think, of uh, the, uh, this wrong approach to dose finding in, in early phase trials. It's, uh, it, it's a, this supposition that each patient is just a kind of random number generator. And we, you know, we, we give that patient a dose. That's like pressing a button on the random number generator. We get a random number. We collect enough random numbers and we can, you know, uh, we can fix a dose that, that causes an, uh, a, a dose limiting toxicity in 30% of, of patients. Sure. There's, well, you uh, know, and let me tell, I think that extends to as well to, even some, some um, and I'd like to ask you a little bit about this, about the economics, but some of the guidelines, you know, as you know, uh, people want to come up with guidelines and standardized treatment, but behind that, there's this thought that if we're smart enough, we know that if you take path A and then you turn at B and then you turn at C, you're gonna have optimal outcomes. Well, you can say that may be a desirable path uh, for maybe a group of patients, but not all patients are going to go through that. Yeah. So, so, so unfortunately, in my opinion, some of this, some of these pathways have now been incorporated into into the the pharmacoeconomic analysis. So, I'll give you an example. You know, in 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 my disease again, in multiple myeloma, there's a group that wants to position itself and serve as a sounding board for payers. So they do analysis of the studies and they do pharmacoeconomic studies. And, you know, they, they work obviously with, with very, very um, sophisticated uh, groups that can do this type of analysis. But one of the problems there is that, that when you see the output of what comes out of some of those analysis, you realize that it's somewhat irrelevant to the clinic. So for instance, in this particular group, uh, the conclusion was that one of the drugs that we have available, it's an FDA approved drug, it's something called Pinobinostat, was the best value, which and we all know in the clinic is the worst drug of all what we have. It's the one that is used the least. But that's what the, that, that modeling showed because it was a presupposition that this guidelines uh, you know, could do that. So that was point number one. But point number two and one that I, I, I alluded to because if, if you are to say that information like this should be used, for instance, for decisions about coverage, which is a whole other topic, those groups didn't even consider some of the basic heterogeneity of patients. You know, forget about even metabolism, but just basic heterogeneity of things like, 
you know, the, the genetic subtypes. I mean, we, we know that that's true for most cancers. If you have a high risk tumor, you do this. If you have a low risk tumor, you do that. And, and if you don't have that in the model, then that's pretty far away from what we should be doing in the clinic. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know what group this is. Maybe you don't want to mention. Uh, oh, no, no. Yes. Yeah, I've written about this. this is the ICER group. The, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> you know, they got a, a Midwest meeting. I've, you know, I've been pretty, yeah. pretty vocal about this for no other reason that, that, um, the, the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, patients may not get their drugs. And, and I don't think we, we've seen that, although the, there's groups that have, you know, thought about working with ICER, the Veteran Administration is thinking about doing that, the CBS, or I think the VA is doing that. But then you got have a similar groups. So we have quite a bit of history on this, for instance, with NICE. You know, NICE yeah. in, in the UK might say, well, this drug is not cost effective, this drug is just, just not good. And I mean, without even going down to the heterogeneity, what if that drug is capable, based on what you propose, say the DTAT, or based on what we know of genetic heterogeneity, to cure and save 15% of patients. So it's a disgrace that we lose that drug just as much as it would be to, you know, not develop a drug that would be really good because, you know, in the first two cohorts, someone had the very serious side effect and, you know, God forbid died from toxicity from one of those drugs. Yeah, so I wonder, are these models typically published? Uh, you know, do people put their code up on, on GitHub? Does ICER put its code up on GitHub when they when they produce one of these models so that it can be- They, they do, so they make the information publicly available. You know, the, uh -huh. there's, there's, there's links to the videos and there, there are these reports. Um, even, even if you said, even if you take them at the face value and say, you know, those groups come together and make those recommendations, you could imagine how this very quickly could um, convert itself into tools that would kind of get us away from a more thoughtful approach to medicine, right? You could imagine how a closed system, say an accountable care organization might say, listen, you know, um, I sort of said panobinostat is the way to go. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do panobinostat and bortezomib, which is one of the drugs we use. So, so, but, 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 you know, honestly, anyone would be on the sidelines. I would say, you know, if, if I had my routers, I wouldn't do that which is what our, our UK colleagues do. And one of the future programs, I've already asked a colleague, I, I want to interview a colleague who used to practice in the UK, now practices here, just to uh -huh. have some contrasting opinions on how that affects their therapeutic choice. Yeah, well, I, I would say to the extent that, you know, hey, one of these models is published and available, you can download the code, um, that, sure. that creates an opportunity for, you know, criticizing the model on its own terms. Uh, the model as it's written is going to tell you how many people uh, you know, let's say it's a step therapy uh, model, right? Sure. You're saying how many people expire before they get to the therapy that would have helped them in a counterfactual uh, setting. Um, right. And, and I, I should correct myself. I, when you mentioned the model, I know they published the reports. I, I, I see what you mean now right now, the raw data. Right. I don't know the answer to that. That would be an interesting question uh, because I, I think that, you know, that would allow yourself to kind of look at it independently and then provide an opinion in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you'd have those two kinds of criticisms you could offer. You could say, let's take this model as given. What are, what are some of the conclusions of it that might have been omitted from the executive summary? Right? Mm -hmm. Which would be how many people um, you know, complete their lives before getting to the therapy that would have helped them? Uh, how, how, many lives does the, you know, how many life years does this cost um, uh, it, versus you know, the, the current clinical practice of, you know, of going to Panabinistat right away? Uh, and then you could also criticize the model construction itself. Well, look, you, you totally failed to recognize this 15% uh, subset of patients. And when we include that in your model, here's what happens. So if those models were open uh, and open to that kind of criticism, I think the, the opportunities there would be enormous. David, uh, if there's people here in the audience that are listening to this video, say from either farm or biotech, or perhaps even more important investors, investors in biotech, oh, yeah. uh, you, you have a value proposition that, you know, if you want to maximize your investment, we need to do more due diligence. That's really what you're saying, because you need to have a better understanding of how to position your drug, you know, for, for patients, because one is, one, it could just totally fail. But even if it's approved, I think this is an under-recognized aspect of your work. Even if it is approved and you don't have a range of doses, then you're missing the boat. Because if for whatever reason, half of the patients have uh, tolerance issues that just cannot get it, then half of your market is gone. So, so, so that's a problem, not only for us from the patient perspective, from the clinical perspective, but also from the economic perspective. And so I, so I think if, if you're out there in the audience, pharma or an investor, I think you should, you should talk more to David. 
because this is a serious consideration. No other field of human endeavor would not consider this as they think about investment. Yeah, and again, you know, this this has been filled. This whole this whole um, journey through DTAC has been filled with surprises of this kind. Uh, you know, on the one hand, it's this it's this you know. Uh, recondite matter of a phase one trial methodology, right? You could look at it as some kind of very small technical problem. And yet it seems to, it seems to, um, uh, you know, reach out its tentacles in all kinds of directions. And, and the, the pharmacoeconomic uh, aspect of this argument is one I actually began pursuing quite early in, in the course of, uh, of my work. You know, no sooner had I finished that DTET paper than I began working on this pharmacoeconomic argument. If we're giving one dose, uh, you know, a, a fixed dose of a drug to everybody, and uh, but different people are going to, um, uh, you know, are, are going to have different uh, optimal doses. Uh, then, you know, clearly we've imposed a constraint on the system, and that's going to cost something. Um, and 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 as you say, you know, it has when you give a one size fits all dose to everybody, you have two costs. There are the people who can't tolerate that one size fits all dose, and who then can't take the drug; they don't get any benefit. Um, at the other end, there are the people who, who could have tolerated a higher dose. And if, you know, if, you're, and if you're still on the upward sloping part of that dose response curve, then uh, the, the failure to offer that patient a higher dose uh, you know, may, may result in a you know, lower probability of achieving a remission or, or whatever other uh, goal of care there is. Uh, so uh, you handicap, you hobble the drug by insisting on one size fits all dosing for. Imagine if we, you know, if we had a single fixed dose of Coumadin or a single fixed dose of insulin. Uh, huh. you know, what, would happen to, what would happen to the, the, the market value and the social value of those drugs? Uh, so yeah, there's a, there's a very, uh, I mean, th there's a very clear argument that you can make to, you know, the C-suite in pharma that if they're doing their, um, if they're meeting their obligations to their shareholders, to maximize value, then they ought to be optimizing uh, the dosing of drugs, which is the, you know, the most, it's the most fundamental um, aspect of giving a drug uh, after making the correct diagnosis. You know, I previously mentioned retirement. I, I, I should have mentioned that still many years ahead of, for me, yeah. I don't see the horizon right yeah. now, but I'm afraid we, you and I probably will retire at some point. And we, you know, as long as the needle is moving in that direction, I would consider that progress because obviously it needs to go in that direction. And more so as we talk about, you know, personalized uh, medicine approaches, but, you know, in medicine, we have to recognize also this empiricism. We have to recognize kind of the Roman approach, if you may, that, you know, Talib talks about in his books. Uh, I'll give you a great example of this, this um, group of drugs that we use for treatment of myeloma are called IMITS, that stands for immunomodulatory drugs. We don't fully know how they work, but they came to us somewhat by serendipity. So these mm -hmm. are derivatives from thalidomide. As you know, it was used as a, as a morning sickness pill in the late 1950s, early 1960s, just because it, it is a sedative, so you know, it's better to be sedated if you're nauseous, and that was the whole principle that why it was mm -hmm. used at the time. And unfortunately, led to all these this tragedies with, with the malformations, right? But, but then what, what happened is uh, it was found to have significant anti-androgenic effects. And uh, the, the late uh, Dr. Folkman at Harvard was you know, lecturing around talking about this and you know, how this is, this is something that should be considered for cancer therapeutics. There's a lot of work with you know, the, the Susumab, et cetera. One of my colleagues actually uh, here, Dr. Berg Sagel, was at uh, one of the lectures from Dr. Folkman. He said, oh, that's a pretty interesting idea. Um, and then um, uh, uh, the, the um, wife of a patient uh, talked to, to Leif, Leif Bergsago, and said, you know, what else can I do? My husband is running out of options. So he said, well, why don't you talk to Dr. You know, Folkman? He's talking about this angiogenic thing. So uh, they called Dr. Folkman. Dr. Folkman said, well, you know, there's uh, uh, maybe this drug called thalidomide, which in in inhibits blood vessel formation, which we think, by the way, has nothing to do with nowadays with, with how myeloma would respond to this. So she went on to call this, this small pharmaceutical company, which was an offshoot of Selenese uh, uh, textiles, uh, Celgene. Back in then, a mom and shop operation, uh, mom and pop, what am I saying? It was a garage operation uh, that, that uh, you know, they sent just enough thalidomide, which uh, had been um, used for, for, you know, some forms of leprosy, but almost no use um, at all here in the Western world. 
they sent pills to the University of Arkansas where this patient was located at. And uh, uh, they, you know, unfortunately the first person didn't respond, but it, as it turns out, luck would have it, they had enough pills to treat a second patient. And that second person re responded. And that led to a whole industry, a whole um, set of pharmaceuticals being developed, uh, you know, subsequent sister drugs, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, et cetera. And, and that was just came out of true serendipity. I mean, you can see that was almost the, the, the you know, famous butterfly effect that had LEAF not been at that conference, maybe no one would have made that phone call. And then we wouldn't have all this class of drugs that are used for the treatment. But it's really the concatenation of all this, this sort of, uh, you know, instances that may, made us now have these drugs. So if I get you right, Rafael, the drug was tried on the basis of a theory about angiogenesis. Correct. That actually, as it turns out, had nothing to do with its therapeutic, therapeutic value in that patient. Correct. It turns out the bone marrow is just an extension of our intravascular space. The, you know, the sinusoids and the bone marrow have high content of oxygen, there's great circulation. I mean, that's why people can do intraosseous administration of IV fluids. You know, they do that in the field, the military does that. So it's almost one and the same. So there was no logic behind that. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, again, like, like Talib said, you know, you build the cathedrals and then you go back and you explain how they were built. So, so you use the drugs, it works. And now we've spent the next, you know, uh, years, what is this, almost 20 years now, trying to figure out how it works. And, you know, we have a much better idea. We, we, we think we have some good leads, but, but, you know, we're nowhere close to where the physicists are. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, you know, you think of cathedrals. I'm not sure what, I haven't read Talib's book, but, you know, these flying buttresses that are such beautiful aspects of the cathedral, um, they were added later on to keep the walls from bowing out. Yeah, it's just fascinating to read about the story. And, and, he, and he was saying, you know, a lot of this, I guess it applies to a lot of historical things. You know, once you go back and you create a narrative for what happened in the past, you kind of make it fit more. And if uh -huh. you would read something like this, you would think about this brilliant, you know, uh, knowledgeable individuals who knew the precise vectors that were needed for the angles of those, you know, those walls to hold those cathedrals in place. So, and a lot of that was, was an empirical process. Uh -huh. Well, you know, if, if we can just start keeping that more in mind, that we're constantly learning, that the, the theoretical basis for our, um, for our interventions you know, may or may not be correct, uh, and, that, and that it should be continuously examined, um, then, you know, we'll, we'll be very, very well on the way toward a much more, uh, uh, you know, open and uh, rapidly learning uh, form of medicine, I think. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. David, before I close, you want to say any final messages, comments, something, something people should think about, um, you know, from uh, take home from this conversation? Oh, gosh. Uh, you know, I think the, the take home is that, um, uh, the take home is that, you know, people, people need to give me a call. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it, uh, and uh, I'm really delighted. Um, uh, Raphael, that we've had this conversation. You've reached out to me as you have, uh, and um, uh, and I thank you so much for your you know your engagement with me around this issue and your enthusiasm uh, for detail. Well, let me let me just say a couple of things. I, I know you you have a series of videos you're trying to promote some of this through Patreon. Ooh. I think in many ways you're you're an innovator. I mean, you just have you know one thousand Patreon, a bunch of other things that I think are paving the way for what will be the future, no doubt, the more sort of open source, you know, science, this whole thing, yeah. with limited space in journals is just such an anachronism. So there's going to be a lot of things that are going to change. Uh, but uh, David, just let me ask you a quick, so your uh, uh, Twitter, your, your, your handle at Twitter is David C. Norris MD, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, for people who want to follow you, I, I will commit, I, I, I will try to spread your gospel as I interact with people who are thinking about phase ones, both in the academic setting and the private sector. And I want to ask you, I want to ask you one last question. I consider your pinned tweet on your profile, probably one of my favorite all time tweets, if not the favorite one. <laughs> and it was, it was one that required me going back and reading. I have to admit, I didn't know the history of this, the, you know, this uh, individual. So, so Ernst Match. Uh, to David Sackett, Albert Einstein, to whom? And, uh, you know, what did you mean by that? Can I, can I ask you if you could yeah, explain yeah. I have my interpretation. I've never asked you this. No, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, you, so, you know, that pinned tweet is, it's my constant reminder to myself of what my timeline ought to be about. Uh, 
and it, it, you know, it goes back to this, uh, this tension between, um, between theoretical knowledge and or kind of you know, what Janet Woodcock would have called nihilistic empiricism. So the, the story there is that uh, Ernst Mach was this, uh, you know, he, he's, the, he's the physicist who gave us the Mach number, right? You know, sure. you say, um, a plane goes Mach Speed two. of uh, travel, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so a really great physicist, but a, a, a kind of um, a mediocre philosopher of science. And there's this interesting story in the, the development of Einstein's um, his, his special and then his general theory of relativity. The things that, that I think helped Einstein develop his special theory of relativity uh, was uh, a kind of reductionist form of thinking. He asked, well, what is time? It's what you measure with a clock. Right? What is what is length? You know what is space? It's what you measure with a ruler, and uh, taking these very operationalized uh, definitions of you know, these these concepts, space and time of all things, right, which he redefined. Uh, uh, taking this operationalized view allowed him to produce the special theory of relativity. Uh, you know, which, which is the which is the this version of relativity that uh, you know, is this early work, uh, 1905, uh, in which he uh, you know suggested that notions like the simultaneity of two events is is relative, uh, so that two events might occur simultaneously to to you, uh, but to me, you know, flying in a spaceship, those those events did not occur simultaneously. Uh, he, uh, in, he in which he suggests that time and space are are intermixed. Now, but in working toward his his general theory of relativity, right? This theory that that gra gravity uh, warps uh, space, um, uh, which you know was very famously sort of uh, uh, proved by the, this observation late recently of gravitational waves. Um, uh, he felt a need to reject Mach's raw empiricism, uh, and uh, that is to me uh, that is to me. Uh, symbolic of what we need to achieve in medicine. If we're to make progress toward a medicine that is individualized, that respects the individual patient, that respects uh, uh, the, the theoretical reasoning that a, uh, that a clinician is capable of, uh, then we need, to, we need to move beyond this raw empiricism. And so what I'm, what I'm doing in that article is I'm, I'm making a connection between Ernst Mach, uh, and 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 his his ideas and uh, David Sackett and his ideas, right? Suggesting yes, they did get, they did provide some progress. Now, the special theory of relativity might be might be like EBM, but if we're to make progress beyond there and get to a general theory, get to um, uh, truly uh, personalized uh, precision medicine, uh, we're going to do that only by moving beyond David Sackett and moving beyond uh, this. Um, raw empiricism of EBM. You know, it reminds me a little bit of, and I think you previously used the word heuristics, we don't try to simplify thinking, we, we really have to try to do that in-depth analysis of the Charlie Wilson's war with uh, Philip Safemore Hoffman was asked on multiple occasions, well, I guess that's good for us, and he would always say, well, it all depends. And it's just going back down to that to that detail and to that depth that really will, will, will make us better. I think this is not unique to to medicine, but certainly we need to be at the forefront of that thought process in medicine. And you've alluded to this many times before uh, with this sort of quest for, for continuous learning. So David, again, thank you. I, I think that I've greatly enjoyed our conversation. You know, I'm, I'm glad we recorded it. It's the, kind of the, the purpose of this, again, it's just to, to share something you're doing. As I mentioned, I'll, I'll keep uh, trying trying to sort of uh, spread the word. Please call David if you know if you have thoughts about this. If you're engaged in phase one, it makes economic sense. You know that's a powerful argument too as well. But also, uh, you know, as we started, it makes patient sense and it's logical and it's ethical. And 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 I hope again that you know as, as time goes by, we'll see more of this. So thank you for what you do and for being here. Thanks, Rafael. I'll I'll say one last thing, and that's you talked about retirement. Uh, yeah. And I I want to stress that my my time frame for ending one size fits all dose finding is actually much shorter than that. And that's, <laughs> that's why I'm reaching out. That's why I've pressed the nuclear button and why I'm reaching out to patients and patient advocates. I think we will we'll be able to do away with one size fits all dose finding in the next one year, 18 months. Well, and I think you, you should be a, a, a permanent fixture. Don't take that in a negative way. We should be a permanent fixture in personalized medicine related conferences because
you know, as much as we talk about the genetic variability, the comorbidities, uh, you know, this, this issues, and we, I mean, the principles of pharmacoeconomics are, are sometimes exploited with very simple things. Great, we have them, but we need to get a lot deeper than what we are. So again, I, I think your work is very, very important in this regard. Thank you so much, Rafael. It's been a real pleasure. Pleasure's mine.